All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Amy Oberholzer from Catch Community Action Together for Children's Health. The entire Catch team and I warmly welcome you to this webinar, the first in a two-part series that we actually never imagined we would be doing, managing the flood of emotions brought on by a pandemic. We are pleased and proud to be partnering with Compass Health Center, and we thank them all for their generosity of time and expertise. Uh, just so you know, we are recording the presentation portion of this webinar a few days after it took place originally on April 15th. We had some technical difficulties that evening, which <laughs> did not allow us to record the event. Um, part two of this webinar series is scheduled for Wednesday, April 22nd, and will address supporting our children's ongoing needs. So our world has been suddenly upended by COVID-19. The upheaval brings with it a lot of emotions, many of which may be powerful and unfamiliar to us. It is our hope that this presentation and discussion will help us understand and manage this emotional roller coaster better and bring us some clarity and comfort. So with that, I am very pleased to announce or to introduce rather our panelists from Compass. Dr. Alex Timchak attended medical school at Loyola University of Chicago Stritch School of Medicine. He completed his residency training at Northwestern University in adult psychiatry and his child and adolescent psychiatry fellowship at Lurie's. Dr. Timchak is the medical director at Compass Health Center in Northbrook, where he treats children, adolescents, young adults, and adults with severe mood and anxiety disorders. Dr. Natalie Gala received her doctorate in clinical psychology from Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago. She then completed her internship at Edward Hines Jr. VA Hospital, followed by her postdoctoral fellowship at Jesse Brown VA Medical Center in Chicago. Dr. Gala is the Associate Director of the Trauma Program at Compass, where she treats young adults and adults who've experienced trauma and are also struggling with severe mood and anxiety disorders. Tracy Pate received her master's degree in social service administration from the University of Chicago. Tracy has worked in the field of trauma for over 20 years. She has worked primarily with young adults who have experienced trauma and she is a primary therapist in the trauma program at Compass. I am gonna sign off now and hand it over to these um, wonderful professionals who I think that uh, you will learn a lot from. So Tracy, take it away. Thank you. Thank you. So when Catch first approached us to do this program, um, they wanted to do something to support the community during the COVID-19 pandemic. I was really impressed with the caring and committed group that wanted to create connections, support the community during these unprecedented times. They came to us at a good time because due to the pandemic, we had just gone virtual and all of our services now are completely virtual. As we discussed um, the program and the webinar, we at first wanted to talk about how to support our children. And as the conversation evolved, many of us were parents. We realized we needed to start with us and how to support ourselves, learn skills to navigate these intense emotions so that we can model this for our children. The second webinar will be focused on how to support our children. We were reminded of the instructions we get when we're on an airplane. <clears throat> and then in the case of an emergency, you put the mask on yourself first, and then you put a mask on your loved ones and family. So an overview of today's webinar, we're gonna look at the possible impact of COVID-19 on our mental health, how to name, normalize, and navigate emotions, and how to seek out resources, what resources are available, and when to ask for help. So I think this New Yorker cartoon can really, in this snapshot, name what happens to us in a day, many times a day. We can talk to somebody, we can open up our phone, we can watch the news, and we hear really intense or devastating news about the numbers of COVID-19 increasing, the numbers of ventilators, not matching the need, the economic impact, 
we can have this intense emotional reaction, we can feel fear, then panic, and then apathy. And it's a cycle that can happen many times throughout the day. So what we wanted to look at are many of the possible emotional reactions to this pandemic, the shelter in place and the new, the new normal. Um, you may feel anxious. You can be anxious about your future, about your health, about your loved ones. Anxiety can show up in many different ways, but some very common physical reactions are increased heart rate, shallow breathing, tightness in our chest, or racing thoughts. We may feel fear, fear about an uncertain future, fearful about the health and safety of ourselves, loved ones, society, uh, fearful of you know, how to get health care, what is safe. We may also feel overwhelmed, overwhelmed with change, overwhelmed with this new normal, working from home, having the kids home. Intense emotions can feel overwhelming, can feel overwhelming to have constant togetherness um, and just not even knowing what we're feeling sometimes and having many different feelings together. We may feel sad, sad that we're missing people, sad about these changes, the suffering loved ones, society, and sometimes sadness can manifest in not enjoying things we usually enjoyed or having difficulty finding things that we want to do. We may experience grief. We're gonna talk a little bit more in depth about this in the next few slides. Um, grief of the loss of our normal schedule, of our usual coping skills, of safety, knowing that we can go to the grocery store and not worry, grief at worrying about the knowing that everyone can get the health care they need. We're going to look at both ambiguous and anticipatory grief when we dive a little bit deeper into the grief response. And with anger may be a response. We may be angry at the, the reaction of the government or other people and how they're responding. And it's also important to know that very often anger can be a secondary emotion that can be covering up some of these other emotions. So on this slide, I put one of my favorite tools. It's a, a feeling wheel. If you Google the feeling wheel, you'll, you'll see these online. And it starts with the primary emotions in the middle, and then they become more nuanced as you go out. So if you are having difficulty figuring out what you're feeling, your children, it's a nice tool to help you identify what you are feeling. So I encourage you to look that up and use it if you find it helpful. So now what we're gonna talk about is the grief and the loss that we may be feeling because of this pandemic. A lot of things changed quickly. Uh, we may have experienced job loss, job change. We may be working from home. Our responsibilities at work might have changed. Family plans, vacations or gatherings may have been canceled, postponed. Might have been looking forward to the wedding, the quinceanera, the bar bat mitzvahs. And they are really meaningful markers in our lives, and it's hard to let go of those. In-person social connections that feed us, that help us feel connected to the community. Grief and loss may show up in this new reality of health risk. Can I go to the hospital? Can I go to the doctor and be safe? Will there be enough resources? Who is safe? And if we have um, elderly parents or elderly family members that are in nursing homes, there may be an increased health risk. Another way grief and loss may show up is that society has changed and we don't know how this is gonna impact us in the future. And it's, you can't go and hug someone when you see them, you wave to someone from a distance, you may not be able to see your friends on a regular basis or family. We're also experiencing grief, grief and loss with kids, sporting events, parties, things that help them feel grounded so that they're also struggling and not having their usual supports. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, grief and loss with difficulty accessing care and support. Now it's all virtual. We may not know exactly how to access this, if it is accessible, and it's a big change. So a lot of these losses are ambiguous. Very often we can put a silver lining on them, but I do have a job or my family is healthy. And then we kind of just push it aside and think it isn't worthy of naming. And I think it is important to name and honor these feelings and these changes and these grief, these grief responses. So I wanted to go over the very famous Elizabeth Kubler-Ross grief cycle. Um, 
this is shown in a wave and I like that um, metaphor for grief because very often it can come in waves and it can come in unexpected times and the intensity can vary. Um, the very first stage that Kubler-Ross identified is shock and denial. So that may show up with avoidance, confusion, elation, shock, or fear. Sometimes people question what the elation response is and very often it can be this denial of the negative impact. For if you ever had that response of I'm home, it's gonna be great, I'll do yoga, I'll cook from home, or I'll make more home cooked meals and then denying the negative impact or the serious implications it may have. The next stage is anger, and we may experience frustration, irritation, or anxiety. We may turn that anger to ourselves, even if we know there is no blame. We may turn it to a higher power, to other people, and just feel angry and irritable in general. The next stage is bargaining, where we struggle to find meeting, reaching out to others, telling one story. Very often in this stage, too, we can engage in the what-ifs, or feeling guilty or overly responsible. And this is a stage where it's really important to notice and to move through so that we don't assume that responsibility and that sense of guilt for an outcome that isn't our responsibility. The next stage is depression, where we may feel overwhelmed, helpless, hostile. We may engage in that flight response. And the last stage is acceptance, where we're exploring options. We have a new plan in place. We're moving on. We acknowledge we cannot control everything, and this is where we accept the reality of our loss. I think it's really important that we move on to this next slide. I saw David Kessler speak after Elizabeth Kubler-Ross died, and he said one of her biggest regrets was that there was a misinterpretation of her model, and that people interpreted it as grief stages that are to be experienced linear linearly, and once you experience, you move on to the next stage. And when I heard him speak, he said it can happen in any order, multiple times, varying intensity. And so if you have that previous knowledge or previous perception of the grief model, you may feel like you're doing it wrong. And so I wanna read this quote from their book on grief and grieving. The five stages of grief are tools to help us frame and identify what we may be feeling, but they are not stops on some linear timeline in grief. Not everyone goes through all of them in a prescribed order. So it's really important to remember this when we're thinking about the different emotions we may have with these, with these grief responses. Here at Compass, we do a lot of dialectical behavioral therapy. And one of the important concepts is that you can hold two opposing thoughts or feelings at the same time. So we can feel grateful and disappointed about things being canceled. We can enjoy extra time with loved ones and feel overwhelmed or irritated by their presence. We can feel hopeful and we can feel like everything's falling apart. We can be a source of support for others and prioritize our needs and fill our own cup. So this and statement is really getting away from these all or nothing statements. So it can allow you to have the grief response and be grateful for what you have. It allows you to enjoy the togetherness you're experiencing at home and feeling overwhelmed by it. And these simple and statements help us get out of the black and white thinking. <clears throat> One of the most important pieces of taking care of ourselves during a pandemic, during a crisis, is practicing self-compassion. Kristen Neff is one of the leading researchers and authors on self-compassion. She defines self-compassion as being threefold. The first essential element of self-compassion is self-kindness. Self-compassion involves being warm and understanding towards ourselves when we are having a difficult time. Fail, make a mistake. Instead of ignoring our pain or punishing ourselves with criticism, we can comfort and care for ourselves in times of need. I really like to think about this as how would you talk to a loved one? How would you talk to somebody else who is suffering? Would you say these things to someone else who's going through a similar situation? And that's a good gauge of if you need to recalibrate and look at how you're talking to yourself. The second element of Kristen Neff's definition is common humanity. We're experiencing a unique time right now where we're all experiencing this pandemic together. 
she says, the very definition of being human means that one is imperfect. Therefore, self-compassion involves recognizing that pain, disappointment, and regret are part of the shared human experience, something we all go through rather than something that happens to me alone. It also means recognizing that our thoughts, feelings, and actions are impacted by external factors, such as culture, genetics, environmental conditions, and also this current pandemic. The third component of Kristen Neff's definition is mindfulness. Mindfulness is a non-judgmental state of mind where we observe thoughts and feelings as they are without trying to suppress or deny them. So we can't ignore our pain or feel, and feel compassion for it at the same time. So it's feeling what's coming up, which is what we're talking about with the feeling wheel, with acknowledging the grief, letting these feelings come up. And mindfulness also requires that we not be over-identified with thoughts and feelings. So it's noticing what's coming up and being self-compassionate with ourselves with what's coming up. Self-compassion, there's a lot of misperceptions that it's either self-pity or self-indulgence. And it's the opposite of these, because when we're self-compassionate, we're able to look at ways to move forward and make the changes we may need to make in our lives, all the while accepting our, our common humanity and that we are human and trying our best. Research done in 2012 and 2015 found that self-compassion is consistently linked to psychological well-being, including increased positive outcomes such as happiness and life satisfaction, and decreased symptoms of anxiety and depression. So I'm gonna read Kristen Neff's quote, it's powerful. This is a moment of suffering. Suffering is a part of life. May I be kind to myself. May I give myself the compassion I need. So I encourage you to look up Kristen Neff and read more about self-compassion because I think it really will help you during this time. And now I'm going to pass the microphone over to Dr. Gella, who's going to talk about ways in which we can navigate these intense emotions. Thanks so much, Tracy. Um, so not only is it important to name um, what's happening and to acknowledge the difficult emotions that may be coming up for us right now, because certainly that is going to be the case. Um, it's also important to think about how can we manage these emotions in a way that's effective for us. So Tracy, if you can go ahead and advance me, that'd be great. Um, so we wanna to present today a, uh, an acronym called FACE COVID that was developed by Dr. Russ Harris, as you can see here. And FACE COVID is, the acronym is, is really representing a set of coping uh, practical steps for coping with these challenging emotions that may be arising right now. Um, it is uh, uh, developed out of the, um, the field of ACT um, and using ACT principles and ACT actually stands for acceptance and commitment therapy. It's a therapy that was developed in the 1980s by a clinical psychologist, Dr. Stephen Hayes, um, an American clinical psychologist. Um, and ACT talks about making room for unwanted internal experiences. So thoughts, feelings, emotions, physical sensations that may be present and uncomfortable. Um, and instead of trying to get rid of them or change them or stop them, um, Dr. Hayes talked about, can we make space for them? Can we acknowledge that they're present and make room for them and carry them with us in addition to other types of emotions, because emotions are important. Um, so they're probably there for a reason. Um, so face COVID comes out of that, that background, that theoretical model. And Dr. Russ Harris is an Australian author and clinician. He has actually a background in medicine, however, currently is a therapist and also a trainer in ACT for other clinicians. Um, and practices ACT, uh, puts out videos. If you've ever maybe seen him on YouTube, he has great ACT videos on YouTube. Um, and he released this 
a short paper uh, naming this acronym FACE COVID. Again, set of practical steps that we can actually take to help us to respond effectively in the face of the coronavirus. So I'm gonna just sort of talk through that, um, that acronym now. So Tracy, if you could advance me, thank you so much. So FACE. The F in FACE stands for focus on what's in your control. We know that fear and anxiety are often emotions that feel pretty inevitable when we're in a crisis. Um, they are normal, quote unquote, as, as we always say with as uh, those in the mental health field, that, that word is a little. Um, but statistically, they are normal to experience in the face of a crisis or a trauma. Um, they are natural responses when there is danger and uncertainty present, which is certainly the case when we are when we are experiencing a crisis similar to what we're experiencing right now. Um, so, Dr. Harris suggests really focusing what on what's in our control. It's very easy to uh, get stuck in, in thinking about what's not in our control right now, and that's actually not a helpful strategy long term. In Instead, um, and well, let me let me even back up. So it's not a helpful strategy for for some pretty important reasons. Um, the first of which is that it often then leads to more anxiety and more fear, um, more hopelessness, more of those unwanted, uncomfortable emotions, almost like adding suffering on top of suffering. So instead, Dr. Harris suggests that we focus on what we can control. So what we can control is unfortunately not our emotions, not directly. Unfortunately, it's also not others' emotions for maybe those parents out there or those, um, those loved ones that we wish we could help right now. That may not be the way that we can help them by directly controlling their emotions. Um, we also can't control what will happen in the future, even if we want to right now. Um, and we also can't control what has already happened in the past. What we can control is what we do right now. And that is our behaviors. So what we're doing right now, not, and again, also not what we did in the past, not what we might do in the future, but what we can do right now. So he explains that we do this with the rest of this word, um, A, C, and E, the ACE formula, as he says. Um, and we, we engage in the ACE formula by what he calls dropping an anchor. So when we experience an emotional storm, all these really uncomfortable, unwanted emotions that may be coming up right now, he suggests that we drop anchor by acknowledging our thoughts and feelings. So acknowledging what is there, even if it's uncomfortable. In the way that a curious scientist might look at their thoughts and feelings. So not with judgment, not with criticism, but really just with curiosity, if we can. He also suggests that we come back into our body in any way we can. So at Compass, we actually teach a lot of different grounding techniques that people can use to reconnect with themselves when they feel like their brain is pulling them too far into the future or perhaps trying to pull them too far into the past um, or when we feel disconnected from what's happening in the, in the present moment. So some examples of grounding strategies might be concentrating on what your feet feel like on the floor in this moment. So what is, what is the weight of your feet in your shoes connecting with the floor? What does that feel like? Really noticing all those little sensations. Another way to ground that we talk about is noticing our breathing, really focusing on what does it feel like to have the air move in and out of my body right now? You know, where is the air coming from? What does the exhale feel like? Where is the air in my body right now? Um, and another pretty easy grounding technique if we are starting to feel disconnected or overwhelmed with emotions is actually pressing our fingertips together, creating enough pressure that we're noticing in that moment that we're right here right now, and then releasing. So those are all examples of how we can um, come back into our body if we feel like our mind is taking us into places that are in the future or in the past. And again, it's challenging to be right here right now. Um, and then he talks about engaging in what we're doing, refocusing our attention, being as present as we can in this moment. I included a hyperlink at the bottom of the screen here 
that are actually a bunch of free audio recordings of different exercises um, that Dr. Russ Harris has put out to help us to quote unquote drop this anchor. Um, so I encourage everybody to check this out. Um, and I believe we also made it available somewhere else on the website. Um, so Tracy, if you would go ahead and advance me, that would be great. So this, um, this is a, a picture, a, an image that Tracy found that I think is so great, and it really um, gives us great example of what we can and cannot control right now. Um, so again, a little bit of a review, but what's inside that white circle is what we can control. We can control our own attitude towards things. Um, we can control our own behaviors in terms of how we are following guidelines, for example. We can control our own social distance, our own time spent on social media, our own kindness and grace towards ourselves and others. And Tracy mentioned self-compassion, so I, I think of that there as well. Um, we can control the time we spend watching the news and listening to the news, reading the news, um, and we can control what we're doing at home, um, making sure that we're engaging things that are important to us, and we'll talk more about that in a second. Outside of that white circle are things that we cannot control, even if we really want to. And we can validate that we want to. Um, I think that's okay, and I think that's pretty understandable. And while also recognizing that we may not be able to. So accepting our realistic limitations. So for instance, a little humor, toilet paper. Maybe we wish we had more, and it may not be available on that day at the grocery store. Um, how long this will last, you know, we would love to know that, and yet we may not right now. We can't control others' reactions right now. We can't control the actions of others right now. Um, we can't control other people on the street that may not be practicing social distancing, even if we wish they were, or other family members, for instance, um, other loved ones that we wish were following the guidelines in the same way we were and may not be. Um, so a good, a good reminder of the fact that we can control what we do right here, right now, and we have limited ability to control the future, control the past, and also to control others. If you could advance me, that would be great. All right, so the second part of the acronym. So this is where he starts actually talking about a lot of the principles that are really important in ACT. Again, that stands for Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, where this, um, where this acronym comes out of. So committed action. We, we in, in ACT, we talk about this as effective action that's guided by our values. So another way of talking about values is what's important to us. So trying to figure out how can we act in, a, in line with what's important to us? What are the behaviors we can engage in? So after dropping anchor, um, again, the formula for doing that is ACE, ACE, we will actually have more control over our actions, which makes it easier to do the things that matter and to probably even figure out what are the things that matter that I want to do. Um, so if we've, if we've figured out, for instance, that um, caring for others is a value of ours, again, something that matters to us, a way that we think it's important to live our lives, um, we can consider right now, how can we express that? You know, is it I cook a meal for someone or myself even? Um, is it I send a text? Is it that I make a phone call? Is it that I play a game with my child? Um, you know, what, what could that look like right here, right now? How could, I, how could I act on that value right here, right now? If physical health is a value of ours or wellness, for instance, perhaps we could go for a run or a walk or engage in stretching, um, cook ourselves a, a healthy meal, um, work on our sleep structure and routine, for instance, um, making sure we're getting to bed on time and waking up at, a, at an okay hour. Um, so he really encourages us to think about what can I do right here, right now that's important to me, that's in line with what matters to me. Um, and the next piece then is engaging in it really fully, really making sure that we are acting on this rather than saying, oh, you know, I'll do it, you know, in a week from now. Um, the O in COVID <laughs> stands for opening up. So I, I mentioned earlier that ACT is based on this idea that instead of changing, getting rid of, eliminating, reducing, all the whatever word you want to use, our emotions and unwanted internal experiences like, again, emotions or physical sensations or thoughts that may come up, can we open up and make space for them? Can we make room for difficult feelings as well as for being kind to ourselves? 
So he is encouraging us here to make that space, to open up to those emotions that may feel really uncomfortable right now because they're already there, even if we wish they weren't, which is again, very understandable. Um, this is where we think of almost a visual that we, we talk about a lot of times at Compass is can we sort of make, make an expansion and, and create that, that space um, and think about allowing the emotions in rather than having to always work against them. The V in COVID stands for values. Again, what is important to us? Our committed actions, our C here, is gonna be guided by that. Really hard to act on behaviors when we don't really understand why we're doing it, right? Probably not that motivating. When we understand why it's important to us, that's gonna make it a little bit easier, maybe a lot easier to figure out, well, what do we wanna do right here, right now? Also, it's important to probably expect obstacles in that. You know, there are, there are a lot of limitations that do exist right now, understandably, um, and to know that we can still live in line with our values in a myriad of ways, even in the face of challenges. So I stands for identify resources. So this is where we get a little bit more practical towards the end. Um, and Dr. Timchuk is going to talk about a lot of those resources in a few moments. Um, but Dr. Harris encourages identify when we need help, when we need assistance, when we need support, when we need advice, and identify who in our, you know, in our circle, um, our small circle, our larger circles, can we go to to seek those resources? Really important right now to be there for each other, of course, and uh, to figure out who we can go to for support. Is it our friends, our families, our neighbors? health professionals, emergency services, um, identifying those resources and, and connecting with those, those folks when necessary. Final step, disinfect and distance. He specifi specifies, excuse me here, that although we may be physically distancing from each other, we don't want to emotionally distance necessarily. That may not be effective for us. Um, we can still emotionally connect with ourselves and with others, even in the face of all this, and even in the face of needing to physically distance. So I think that's kind of a nice note to end on. With that being said, Dr. Timchuk, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, and um, again, I appreciate the opportunity from Catch. Um, thank you, Rachel, Julie, Amy, for uh, inviting us and for um, for the redo uh, because we had some uh, technology issues. So um, I'm going to uh, step in about when to ask for help. So I'm a child, adolescent, and adult psychiatrist. And uh, when I was asked to do this presentation, I was doing some research and reviewing some things and was thinking about how disruptive this has been for, for, for my practice. Um, I, the, the, a psychiatrist's quote unquote physical exam is having a person in the room and communicating with them and uh, having to transition to virtual care um, actually uh, it has exceeded expectations. I would much rather be talking with a patient in my office, but one of the, the glimmers here is that um, we have this avail availability through Zoom and for any of you who have had to you, uh, try and find care with a child psychiatrist, the uh, benefit is that many of whom who had months and months of waiting lists are now available. So the access to care for not just psychiatrists, but therapists, um, if you do need um, a next level of help, um, that's one of the, the silver linings here that, um, that the availability and the, the, the fact that you don't have to drive and deal with traffic on the Kennedy or wherever is, is, a, is, a, is a plus. So um, one of the other things to, that I was looking at was about uh, considering that do we all, all the adults really have an adjustment disorder. Now that, that's a, a diagnosis that uh, comes along with usually a big disruption. So if a family has to uproot in the middle of the school year and a child has to you know, change schools and leave their friends, uh, or if parents get divorced, or if a grandparent passes away, um, and if there's symptoms that develop, it can be a, uh, an adjustment disorder. So, um, which, which is technically the development of emotional behavioral symptoms in response to a, an identifiable stressor uh, that develops within three months of that stressor. And those symptoms lead to marked distress uh, that is out of proportion to the severity uh, or the intensity of the stressor leading to significant impairment. And so uh, it, it struck me pretty quickly that 
none of us have had to deal with this kind of uh, crisis before. So I don't know that any of these reactions are, are uh, considered marked distress that is out of proportion to a pandemic since really in our lifetime, no one's had to live through them. So uh, one thing to consider that's different about COVID too as an adult is that um, and I was trying to think of an analogy that has had such a nationwide impact. And the first thing that came to mind was 9-11. But uh, for those who maybe lived in the West Coast or in Chicago or in Florida, when 9-11 hit, yes, it was a big deal. Unless you had a relative who lived in New York City, the, the impact was not immediate. Um, and I would say, I think we all are experiencing that the impact of COVID has, unlike a tornado or an earthquake in Haiti, has clearly disrupted our lives. So we're part of this, we're all in this together. And I know you've heard people saying this a lot, but I, I think this is unique in the sense that, I don't know that we've ever really had to worry about, as Dr. Gellis said, are we gonna be able to have enough toilet paper? So, uh, so this is unprecedented, as we all know, on many fronts. Um, and so some of the symptoms that can come up are what I'll call distress reactions um, or symptoms of disadjustment. Um, one of them is sleep disruption. Um, maybe you guys have seen uh, when looking online, there's probably been six or seven articles in the past two weeks about all the strange dreams people are having. And uh, why is that the case? And arguably because uh, according to one, study, 90% of people are, are abiding by the stay at home rule. And so when you're really not getting the access or the, the bandwidth of, of, of dealing with traffic, dealing with an office, dealing with uh, uh, meetings and, and being at home with your kids or, or with your grandparents or with your parents or grandparents, uh, it's impacting our dreams. And so sleep disruption is a major issue uh, as a distress reaction. Um, a decreased sense of safety, I think both Tracy and Natalie talked about one of the things that we maybe never even thought would be a, a safety issue would be going to Starbucks or going to Jewel to go shopping. And um, fortunately, I think people have adapted very well, but always having that nagging thought in the back of your mind about, do I pass the asymptomatic person who's going to potentially cough before I even realize it? And is that something that's going to impact me and not just me, my whole family? Um, and uh, another thing that you might recognize are an increase of what we call somatic or, or physical symptoms. So if you are maybe in the conversation of being furloughed or maybe you lost your job and when you wake up in the morning you have but butterflies or, or nausea and you're not hungry during the day, um, maybe you're getting headaches, maybe you're clenching your jaw, maybe you're just so used to being tense because the future is so uncertain, a lot of physical symptoms can develop. And emotional ones, of course, as well. Irritability is a, is a major one. Irritability is not just a, a, a hallmark symptom of depression and anxiety in kids. It can also be you know, in adults. In distractibility, um, thinking about what's going to happen with work. Um, my colleague, who I thought never could lose their job, just emailed me saying they got laid off. And so trying to be present with your kids and help them with e-learning or focus on work when you may not have a job is a big challenge and also a way that people react to distress. Wanting to isolate, uh, not wanting to deal when you're eight-year-old asks you for the fifth time in 20 minutes about how to do a math problem that you thought you explained. Um, your kids wanting to play Fortnite, they get an escape, but where's your escape, right? Um, you're going on social media and you're seeing a lot of scary stuff. And maybe you don't even have the opportunity to avoid your family members. Maybe you're living in a two-bedroom condo with one bathroom and, again, the kids' grandparents are staying with you because let's say their nursing home has an infection and you don't even have the option to not be or to be alone. And maybe your only option is to be in your bedroom, but you don't wanna spend 22 hours a day in your bedroom because that's also gonna cause some problems. So those are some of the challenges that can uh, really present themselves in terms of distress reactions and symptoms. Um, Tracy, could you please advance the slide? So um, when to ask for help. So the increase in acuity of symptoms. Um, so I think if you're really struggling and you're recognizing and maybe your spouse or your kids that not only am I dealing with a really un unprecedented environmental stressors, but if your normal modes of adapting, like typically when I'm stressed, I can go for a run or I can FaceTime with my brother or I can 
email a friend or maybe I can listen to some music. If you're finding that those are not providing any re relief, then that's something to take note of. Increased in interpersonal conflict. Um, your spouse or your sibling, someone whom you really find that typically is, is a relief for you, and you just don't want to deal with them. Your wife or your husband tells you something that you don't really like and you can't confide in them, that's a concern. Um, increased substance use, not surprisingly, if people aren't driving anywhere, hey, I can, it's four o'clock on a Tuesday, maybe I could just have a glass of wine, that will help me feel better. Um, but if that's happening Monday through Friday and, and happening twice as much on the weekends, um, that can not only, only help you avoid the anxiety for a little bit, but the rebound symptoms might be even worse. That, that nausea in the morning, maybe not just from a hangover, but uh, if you're using a lot of alcohol, even very subtle withdrawal symptoms are feeling more anxious and edgy. Uh, so that's something that shows that maybe this is beyond just frustration with COVID, that um, signs of, of depression and anxiety are developing. Um, and I think we covered this one, stress exceeding the ability to, to cope. So if your, your previous mode of acting when you're frustrated isn't giving you any relief, then it's time to start to think about maybe asking for help. And I would start with your, your family, people whom you trust, your best friend, um, and saying, hey, are, you know, we're just trying to normalize what's going on because this is arguably a, a, a new normal every day. But if your best friend, if your coworker who you trust is saying, yeah, I'm dealing with this too. But if they're saying, you know, hey, Alex, I'm really worried about that. That doesn't sound okay. Or I'm really worried that this is going far and beyond. Take that feedback. And I think fortunately, um, everyone's recognizing that mental health is at the forefront of their minds. And I would say a lot of the stigma or barriers that maybe would have prevented people from sharing about their distress, um, fortunately are being br broken down because uh, again, I think not to be, you know, use the catchphrase, but we are in it together. And the way we're having to connect is virtually. And if someone who you love sees that you're hurting, I would hope that they would share that with you. So um, can you go ahead and advance it please, Tracy? Okay. So for those who have pre-existing mental health concerns, I think we covered this may increase acuity of symptoms, but let me talk about a specific diagnosis that has to do with germs or contamination like obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, and I'll circle back to this uh, for a question that was brought up in the first presentation at the end, but not surprisingly, if someone has, has struggled maybe even for years about contamination fears and worked with their um, exposure and response prevention therapist, uh, also known as ERP, and gotten to a good place, well, it's going to be really hard to control the intrusive thoughts about anywhere I go or around any person, I might be around COVID, and how do I deal with that? Uh, people with obsessive compulsive disorder as adults know that it's not rational, a lot of the intrusive thoughts, but I think we'd all be hard pressed to say that because of the way the infection has happened with 41,000 Americans dying as of today, that it's probably rational that you're worried about germs, but how is that going to impact your ability to function? And the second thing is in terms of difficulty as accessing care, uh, it's a real question. If you go to a doctor's office or a therapist's office, um, you know, if you cut your finger, do I really need to go to the ER and get stitches or can I wait because I don't want to be exposed and I don't want to bring that exposure back to my family. So those are things that um, are very valid questions. Um, and again, fortunately with the uh, availability for, for mental health, of course, for, for you to reach out to a therapist and do a virtual visit, it's not the same as in person, but um, that is something that again, is an option that maybe even a month ago wasn't available for most providers. Uh, and the good news is that the governor with the executive order has relaxed a lot of the bureaucratic barriers that stood in the way. So um, insurance companies are also going to be willing to pay, whereas before they wouldn't, which is also very good news, especially if you're worried about finances or uh, job insecurity. So uh, can you please go ahead and advance it, Tracy? Okay. So for those uh, without pre-existing mental health concerns, never seen a therapist, never seen a psychiatrist. This is all totally new. How do I deal with not being able to see my friends? That was my mental health. I'd go out on Thursday night or go to book club. Um, I'd go to coffee with my girlfriends in the morning. Um, so FaceTiming with your friends or doing a Zoom call or a happy hour can be helpful. But if that's not something you've ever done before, it's going to take some time to adapt to it. And I touched upon this earlier. 
admitting that you're struggling may have not been part of your personality from before. And um, wanting to be vulnerable to your friends takes some courage. And I think fortunately, um, if you're watching this video now, or if you're coming to catch, I think you have courage to recognize that I need to prepare myself, not just for me, but for my kids. And so I could reach out to them uh, and maybe tell them. Um, some of the things, uh, go ahead and advance it, please, Tracy. Um, so, um, before we get to the referrals, um, maybe go back one more time, sorry, because otherwise, uh, there we go. Some of the things that, um, as a psychiatrist, what I would recommend, specifically related to severity of symptoms. So, if, if you're not functioning, if you're not able to get out of bed, not able to go to work, and God forbid, but you're having symptoms like maybe I shouldn't be around anymore, scary thoughts, suicidal thoughts, that's a red flag that you need to reach out right away. Um, and because that's an imminent safety concern. Um, if you are on medication, if you've had a history of depression, anxiety, ADHD, now is probably not the time to change them. Um, and I would request from your provider just to get extra refills so you don't have to go back to the pharmacy. Uh, just because, again, we're trying to limit exposure to potential infection. And to get an extra month, um, most psychiatrists, I think, would be willing to do that. Um, one of the coping skills we talk about at Compass is called SEEDS, which has to do with self-care. Uh, it stands for sleep, eat, exercise, doctor's orders, or taking your medications, and then finally self-care. So we already touched upon sleep. Uh, trying to have a regular routine is really important. Um, I know your kids say, well, the really good Fortnite games don't start until three in the morning. Mm, I, yeah, I've heard that one before. You really want to try and keep regular hours because if you're or your kids are waking up at, at at eight in the morning or nine in the morning and going to bed at three, it's gonna be really hard to be functional during the day. Same thing with eating patterns. Um, you may not be a big breakfast person, but try and eat your meals at the same time every day. We are very pattern-based creatures. Circadian rhythms are a thing for a reason. <laughs> Most people do much better when they follow those things in terms of a med schedule, in terms of uh, eating and sleeping. Uh, so again, we covered meds, doctor's orders. Um, if you have diabetes, making sure that you're hypervigilant, especially because your risk factors are higher for COVID. And then uh, self-care, and, and Tracy talked about self-compassion. I've heard this quite a bit about, am I doing enough? Uh, just staying home, I, I, am I being productive? I'm seeing on Facebook that, you know, my friend in New York organized an airlift for 10,000 masks that they found. You know, what have I done? I would really caution you to be careful about social media. Um, I've heard about really pretty awful stuff about um, teenage parents shaming other teenage parents about, I saw your kid not socially distanced with another kid at the park, how dare you? Um, even though obviously the intention is in the right place, didn't really come off in the right way. So I think that's one thing to be very mindful of is that social media can be really hard and um, giving yourself maybe a half an hour, but if you're noticing that your mood is tanking, maybe it's time to go outside instead, especially since the, the, the weather is nice. Um, and hopefully using uh, Zoom or FaceTime with family members can uh, keep you connected and they're probably expecting it and wanting to talk to you. Um, I've even had people do Easter dinners or Passover seders with Zoom pretty effectively. So I think this is the, assumed to be the rule rather than the exception. So try reaching out instead of going online where you can get some in vivo feedback. So. Um, I do want to transition for the sake of time just in terms of a brief comment about how to address kids and we are going to be doing part two that's going to be this Wednesday at 730 which it's supporting our children's ongoing needs but I do want to touch upon just some uh, advanced copy here. So number one just don't be afraid to talk, uh, especially if your kids are our, our grade school age. Um, try and be use um, developmentally appropriate language just saying, I don't want you to get sick. I don't want me to get sick. I don't want grandma to get sick. That's why we, we didn't go down to Florida to see them for spring break. That's why they couldn't come over for Passover or for Easter uh, because they're at higher risk of getting sick. Um, we don't want to scare them. Uh, and, you know, there is a point where saying too much can happen. So, uh, but you do want to be versed in what's going on. And I think for older kids, especially the teenagers when it's nice outside, I swear no one's gonna be right next to each other at the park. And you know, meanwhile, you see 500 kids at the park. So I think being up on the data and saying, especially last week when this first aired, 
that, uh, you know, this is going to be the peak week. And the answer is no, I'm not comfortable with you being around your friends. We may have very, very uh, well-wishing accomplished teenagers, but um, you can still say no, because again, this is unprecedented and they might not be happy. And they may say, fine, we're going to go play Fortnite for another hour. And I think choosing your battles, especially with screen time is important with kids, because of course we don't want them on for four or six hours, but if it's your sanity and you need to go exercise or FaceTime with some friends to, to unwind, for them to have extra screen time, for you to be a better parent, that's okay. Um, <clears throat> And I think that uh, uh, goes to my next point, which is as parents, we need to deal with our anxiety first. If we're coming into a conversation with kids and we're super nervous because of we heard that um, unfortunately a teenager passed away in Arlington Heights or that um, someone in, my grandpa in, in the grandparents' building is sick, Kids can always, they're always smarter than we think they are and they pick up on anxiety. They're very finely attuned because they know this is a normal times. So maybe now would not be the time to have that conversation with them if you're super anxious. Take a break saying, you know what, I, I'm going to go get a cup of tea and I'll come back because they will pick up on it. <clears throat> I think I, I covered this, making sure you're using facts. You don't need to go to the CDC website every day. But uh, the good news about the facts is that we can be reassuring. The vast majority of our kids, in truthfully, of, of people who are middle age, even people above 65, are going to get through this okay. So try and be reassuring. Don't don't lie and say there's risk out there, but unless your son or daughter is immunocompromised, has significant asthma, diabetes, if they're doing social distancing, which I suspect most of you and your, and your kids have done, chances are they're going to get through it okay. But you can say I have to be cautious because we've never dealt with this before. Um, and then finally, this goes without saying, keep your kids busy. And especially if they're younger kids, uh, when they're taking a break from Roblox, <clears throat> watching them do symbolic play can be really important because you might learn a lot about what they're thinking and feeling. So I think that about covers all of my points. I do want to come back to some of the questions, though, um, that I do think that were excellent. And uh, so, I, I mean, I catch them all, but I'll, I'll, I'll tackle the first one and then uh, toss it to Natalie and Tracy. But one parent asked, um, I have a, a teenager who wants to visit their grandfather who is, is living alone and wants to see them. Is that okay? So I think I touched upon this before, but if you have a very, very high functioning, responsible teenager who you feel like is capable of socially distancing, um, it's up to you. I also think it's reasonable to say, you know what, maybe let's wait another week because I'm worried about my dad. Um, <clears throat> One thing that I really want you guys to be careful about is that teenagers are not going to respond well to I told you so. So let's say you, your teenagers, maybe not the most reliable, um, breaks curfew, maybe doesn't turn in their phone at night. And they say, Dad, it's going to be fine. Grandpa Joe really misses me. So let, let's play out the worst case scenario. He sees Grandpa Joe and Grandpa Joe gets sick. What are you going to tell your son? Like, I told you so, you shouldn't have gone. Really, that's on you parents. And so you have to be their super ego right now, which may not be comfortable, but um, neither will be the conversation about, oh my gosh, I let this happen. And Grandpa got sick. So do you have any thoughts about that, Natalie or Tracy? No? Okay. Oh, I'm going to unmute. <laughs> um, no, I think that that makes uh, just a ton of sense. And, and again, it, it's a lot of uncomfortable um, experiences that we're dealing with right now. And I think, like you said, Dr. Timchuk, better to be safe um, and prepared than, you know, than regretting that later. Okay. So the next question was, what do I do with bored college kids? Uh, so as of last Friday, when, when schools were canceled, um, I, I think trying to be busy, again, th be careful about wanting them to be too productive. But uh, what I had said was to tell your son or daughter, um, when you're back at school, hopefully in the fall, um, and you tell your friends, or they ask you, what did you do during COVID? You want to do something that you want to be proud of, right? So whether or not that's learning to do coding, getting in shape, um, reading the Brothers Karamazov, although I'm pretty sure they're not going to want to do that, um, but but trying to do something other than being on their phone um, and to challenge them. And again, recognizing that you're 
kind of having to treat them like an adult. Well, if they're in college, they are technically an adult, but uh, that, that's, I think, having them be part of a routine as well, contributing in the house, not just taking the garbage out, but saying, hey, we need to repaint the basement or I'll pay you if you can, you know, can, you can put in the new driveway, something along those lines to help keep them busy so they can feel like they're being productive. Tracy, Natalie, anything to add? <laughs> Yeah, I just think that's really a good tip. I think looking back and how you want to handle this, this is a critical time in our nation's history and yeah. we're a part of the solution. And then how we spend our time at home, mm -hmm. developing our skills and then also modeling it. So I've tried mm -hmm. to take up knitting while my kids learned a new skill mm -hmm. so that we can all learn a new skill together. Yeah. That's great. And I, I think this really ties into Again, re remembering our acronym FACE COVID to the um, both the C and the V in there, you know, identifying what is important to us, how can we express that right now, um, even if, you know, the same options aren't available right now, there, right. there probably are still ways that we can do things that matter to us that are important to us, and that's ultimately what's going to feel fulfilling um, right. and feel meaningful. I agree. And just to tie in Tracy's grief slides, um, there, there's a kind of grief that you didn't touch upon, but I do think that is novel here, which is, it's, it's called disenfranchised grief. So how many classes didn't have a graduation, right? All of the things that previously di uh, disenfranchised grief is for things that people typically don't grieve. So um, like, like a, um, well, like not being able to have an eighth grade or a senior graduation, not being able to have a prom, uh, you know, where, where no one's had to deal with before. So I think trying to be mindful that this is going to be hard for your teenagers as well. They missed out on arguably some of the best experiences in high school. So I think trying to recognize that, uh, that, that there's a grief process for them as well, beyond not just seeing their friends, all of these milestones that we've all had to take for granted. Um, I think um, just two more quick questions. One of them was what for those who do have OCD and they have exacerbations or worsening, how do you deal with that? And so um, I am going to throw in a, a little bit of a plug here because we are Compass is hosting another webinar um, about treating anxiety in the era, to, era of COVID. So it is geared more towards the clinician, but it is open to everybody. And uh, it is, there's one on the 21st, um, which is tomorrow, uh, from 11 to 1, and then the 23rd from 4.30 to 6.30. And you can register at the compasshealthcenter.net website, but uh, using DBT, CBT, and ACT to specifically address how to treat anxiety in this era. So um, that is free for everybody to join, um, I believe. And the idea is that um, you really want to work carefully with, hopefully you do have a therapist, so you could be reasonable. So how many times should I wash my hands? If I had it down to five per day, when I wake up, after breakfast, after lunch, or, or you know, whatever, uh, I think trying to be flexible is really, really difficult, especially because you also have to be safe. So this is not the time to do an exposure about not washing your hands. And so I think that's a nuanced question to really kind of drill down with your therapist. Um, and if you're really struggling to reach out to an exposure and response prevention therapist who has a comfort level with OCD, uh, because it's medication can be very helpful with OCD, but it's not the whole thing. You need to have an experienced clinician who can help you, who you're not going to get reassurance from every time, but um, safety obviously is different here versus germs, uh, germophobia, contamination fears in previous eras. Okay, any other comments on that guys or no? Okay, so I think the last thing was um, the pressure to be productive. I think we covered that briefly, but not everyone needs to be able to sew masks at home. Uh, you are being productive if you're socially isolating uh, and feel proud of that. And um, whether or not you decide to finally repair that hole in the basement wall where the kids threw the football five years ago and it just didn't take your time, something that small, uh, using self-compassion, I don't need to consider myself being selfish, but um, I think taking it one day at a time and giving yourself the, the opportunity to say, you know, I do want to read the Brothers Karamazov. I haven't read it ever and now's the time uh, is, is something that um, it, it is certainly worth considering. So being productive um, and especially being careful on Facebook, that is for you to decide. That is not for the internet to decide. And I, I would add too, just um, keep in mind, you know, it, it is a balance, right? And we are dealing with more, um, 
more uncomfortable emotions, more uh, just more of those those emotions that take up a lot of energy um, to manage on a day to day basis. So even though it, it may feel like we have just a ton more time in our day, um, you know, we may we may be expending additional emotional energy kind of trying to cope the best we can with some of those emotions. And um, so if self-care looks like, as Dr. Timchuk said, reading a book, and that's in line with what matters to us and what's important to us, then, you know, maybe we can actually cut ourselves a break. Um, we talk at Compass about something called compare, um, compare and despair. This idea that if we are comparing on social media to everyone else, um, and what they're doing on, you know, that they're proud of, that they're, they're showing off to the world, um, that may cause us to experience additional despair, suffering, you know, uncomfortable emotions, and it may not be reality. So um, just being mindful of, you know, again, everything on social media may not be representing the full accuracy of how others are feeling. Um, and they may might not be doing those amazing things each moment of every day. Maybe they are also um, slowing down and maybe that's I was just thinking of compare and despair too. Mm -hmm. And I think it's what, you know, inspired Catch to come to us because there were so many articles mm -hmm. talking about how to be productive, how to look at this positively. And there was very little looking at some of these emotions that are uncomfortable or if you're struggling. Mm -hmm. And so I think it is what was the impetus be behind creating this webinar. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that input. For sure. Well, I, I, on that note, part two, supporting our children's ongoing needs in the era of COVID is scheduled for this Wednesday. That's the 22nd at 730. Uh, so I will be there as well with two different Compass therapists. Thank mm -hmm. you, Dr. Gela and Tracy, uh, for your help. Um, but uh, we are we'll working with uh, Roz Lessam and Margaret Lewis, who both work with adolescents. And um, thank you for listening. Uh, this isn't a podcast. I feel like it is at this moment, though, but it's a <laughs> webinar. Uh, and um, we appreciate uh, if you stuck around to the end. Thank you for doing so. And thanks again to, uh, to Catch for, uh, for hosting us. And um, stay safe, everyone. And we will get through this. Yes. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Pleasure. Take care. Okay. Okay, bye. Bye.